Hello there. I'm having a flu, so I'm going to play more than talk. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me to perform here, and I feel honored and humbled to share the stage with such an innovator like Robert. Um, I come from a different background than both Robert and Anna musically because uh, I was never really a classical player. The way I play the flute, I sometimes reflect if it's because when I wanted, when I was supposed to, to choose my instrument at 11 years of age, when I was a kid you had to play the recorder and then you had to play the mandolin and then you could choose an instrument. <laughs> So I wanted to play the drums. Nope, you couldn't get the drum lessons at that time. Okay, electric guitar, that's my choice. Sorry, no possibility you can play Segovia perhaps, but no, no. So I, it had to be my third choice, the flute. So uh, that was my approach to the instrument. How can I make this instrument sound like drums or electric guitar? I never wanted it to sound like the classical flute until I went to university and I was really trained in doing that, which I'm very, very grateful for, of course. Um, and for me, it's always been improvising has been the natural state of music for me. So. Uh, I was cheating my teacher for several years because I learned all the pieces by heart and then I played him with a, with a sh score in front of me and he said, well, you're improving in your sight reading, Anders. <laughs> I didn't read. <laughs> we made a copy and my mother wrote the notes below and I learned it by heart. So. Uh, My, when I started playing, my earliest compositions maybe reflect this kind of approach. The titles of these immortal pieces are like Electric Toothbrush or Goose Fart. So you can imagine my sound ideals as a 13-year-old flutist in Uppsala. A few years later, I of course already had the Wawa pedal and everything, the whole electronic kit, so I could do that. But a lot of the things I did and have developed over the years, um, I will show a little of it when playing on this big contrabass flute, which I bought uh, from Eva Kingma when we had a festival here in 2009. And all the things I can do on that instrument is actually what I can do on the little flute also, but it, it's enlarged because it's such a long tube and much more air. Um, it's uh, two octaves below the C flute. And it could be worth knowing also that my musical language is uh, in jazz and Afro-American music, of course affected by my heritage as a Swedish musician growing up in Sweden, but also a huge influence from uh, especially Indian classical musicians that I've been fortunate to work with for almost 30 years now. Uh, which of course have meant a lot to my flute playing, all the fantastic uh, techniques in the Bansuri playing, but also the Japanese Shakuhachi playing. Basically, saying that I've been basically playing in a sort of a tonal, rhythmic concept within jazz or world music, and more recently actually doing more solo uh, performances where the big flute became a catalysator for my work solo. So what I'm playing for you now is based on a performance that I did 
uh, in collaboration with a choreographer and uh, our um, residence was about to uh, create a dialogue with a exhibition of uh, the painter and artist Louise Bourgeois who had a big uh, exhibition called Mother and Child at the Nordic Watercolor Museum. So um, the inspiration was vision, pictures, and all the music was created in close symbiosis with the movement of the dance.
tack. Um, so this instrument, uh, of course, was very important to get access to the deep sonorities that I didn't have as a flute player before. Um, I had a few things in mind. I must just change from performative mode to speaking mode. <laughs> I think I have a little switch somewhere up there. Uh, I met Robert actually uh, in 1989 when I looked the same but was quite younger. <laughs> and uh, it was a huge inspiration because uh, Robert has also been influenced by Indian classical music, music and uh, the Bansuri playing, it's a bamboo flute, it's six holes. And what you can do with a bamboo flute is that you can do glissandi. And uh, I tried to do that on my open hole flute with some success bending with the embouchure. And then I have open holes, which was a huge step, of course, to get access to when playing jazz and blues, to have But what Robert uh, developed that uh, made a huge impact on me was the fact that you can keep down the key and open um, the hole, which uh, made it possible to make more glissandi. And uh, that meant a lot to my playing in uh, collaboration with Indian artists, with a group called Minta and later as a soloist in India, of course not trying to play raga music the way it should be played, because that's a life project. I do that next life, perhaps. But my way of ins getting inspiration from different parts of the musical world um, has been to try to broaden my options on the Western instruments that I play. The silver flute, the saxophone, or the, the other flutes. Because one, one really profound experience for me was my first tour in India. And um, the Swedish guys in this band were pretty confident in playing Indian music in Scandinavia. We were considered that we know how to play these ragas and play these rhythms. But when performing in Bombay and in a huge concert hall and on the first row was sitting the peers of Ravi Shankar and Ali Akbar Khan, the tabla player of Ravi Shankar, and they were sitting there, I realized before going on to stage, uh-oh, I can't fake playing Indian music. So what, what I learned when, when I look back to it as a crossroad was they appreciated our uh, steps towards learning about their music. But what really moved them was when I was playing the traditional overtone flute from Sweden or uh, Harja Dalspipa when playing very Swedish sounding folk music that was really that made them listen and come after the show. And it helped me in the process of realizing how important it is to have a starting point in your own personality, your own identity as an artist and human being with your own reference system. And saying that meaning, I would say if you have this open 
the metaphor with the silo, like I like a lot that Robert used. If you turn down that silo and look wide, you can pick what tricks your taste and personality and want your will and desire to express. Uh, I will play a little uh, showing perhaps how I've been using the different techniques from, from other flute traditions. Man måste valla fingrarna. Man vill gärna ha bakhalt när man ska göra glissan. It's not like in the ski olympics, you don't want to slippery backwards. I did wash my hair by the way. In a, in a North Indian rag called Hansadvani. It's a pentatonic scale, very often played by uh, the famous Hari Prasad Chaurasia, a flute player that is like the icon of North Indian flute playing, which I have been fortunate to meet a few times. Um, and you can also hear some Nordic influences, perhaps. Uh, 
Finally, I just want to make a very brief uh, example also how in collaboration with, uh, with uh, instrument uh, builders and innovators, uh, we can extend our possibilities. I hope later in the common with talk together that Robert get a chance to show his glissando head joint that he was the one who invented, uh, which is an amazing uh, invention to how you can explore glissando techniques. Another technique is uh, to give, as I mentioned, I'm inspired by the flute world from Asia. It's Shakuhachi, I mentioned Bansuri, but also in the Chinese and the Korean music, they use membranes on the bamboo flute. So um, it's finger holes, and then you have a membrane where you put uh, rice paper, and it vibrates. And um, the flute, Dutch flute builder Eva Kingma, with whom I work, uh, she came up with the idea together with the Swiss flute player called Matthias Siegler that how about doing this on the silver flute? So uh, that was really thrilling me. So what, what we can do is having this magic silver string. <laughs> So I open this key and there's a membrane there buzzing. So I sat down one of my silver head joints and paid a lot of money to make her make this. So it's the world's most expensive kazoo. <laughs> It's not to dance, but as I suffer also to wanting to say too much, 
I thought that just reading perhaps I can condense better and get more direct to the point and hope that I can communicate my thinking behind uh, my research here at OSM.
can you see me? Like, is it okay? <laughs> um, first, with this short essay, I'm going to read. I'm leaving so many of the voices which are following me, but I will, of course, decide to focus on my own. Thank you. <laughs> like, difficult. I will start by stumbling on the notion of extended techniques. Instead, I would like to address transformations of my musical practice through othering words, mixture and contamination. This choice comes from a struggle in framing experimental creative practice that are fundamental to any musician's creating learning process as extensions, as a peripheral area in relation to another central body of standardized techniques. On a global scale, the almost absolute exclusivity regarding the st standardization of musical practice inside the institution of higher education belong to the European model of conservatory. The current disestabilization of the conservatoires and institutions of higher education caused by a phantasmagorical threat of the disappearance of one of the last pieces of European classical heritage and an ensuing generalized amateurism reinforced the slogan of maintaining excellence, of a dis disciplinary practice, of a certain kind of virtuosity that rejects everything that is not in accordance directly, directly with a systematic, intensive and unquestionable practice imposed as the tradition which makes difficult the opening to a diversity of marginal and experimental practice. But would extended technique, techniques become a next standardized body of confined westernized practices to be reproduced and consumed across musical institutions? And what artistic research made inside the same institutions that standardize musical practice has to say? Myself, in my research, I imagine a mixture as method of artistic investigation. A mixture inside the relation flute-body-flutist. I mix the roles, interpretation, improvisation, composition. I mix the space, concert hall, gallery, underground cistern, backyard, mountain. I mix mine with yours through co-creations. I mix the flute with bottles, with tubes, with balloons, with lamps, with video, with plants, with aluminum foil. I mix cores with drones, with gardens, with angels. I mix myself with strangeness. Mixture as a method grew out of my growing concern of being an excerpt, oh sorry, on being an expert in being an excerpt of myself. <laughs> Though this mixture experimentation flavor was already inside, and I believe it's inside every one that is pushed towards music practice, musical practice, it was constrained and par paralyzed by a matter that I name here the question of the specialized fragmentation. So without being able to combine practice that coexisted inside, almost isolated, I was looking for a way to tune out a certain being the flutist, to tune out an image inside that guide my practice so far. But the mixing didn't happen in a random manner. It was guided by encounters. So above all, it's a mixture from, mixture from the listening and directing my voice to another. And it started timidly as an open towards musicians and artists nearby me, but I hope with time can give me breath for longer flights. The mixture as a method doesn't aim a new discipline, a fusion or a disintegration of border, an art with aura of a full art. It's not a yearning to become holistic, integrated, multitasked, hyper-extended, or a queen of new royal knowledge. On the opposite, I search for a confusion, a mixture in transformation, because in the impossibility of exercising and performing all the roles in the plenitude of their specialized practice, I create a sp space inside myself in transformation, capable of listening through mixing me another, places of rigidity inside myself and in my surroundings, with a particular focus on the relation body-flutist. 
fluid. So this mixture in metamorphosis enables a deviation of this image sovereign inside me, of the fluid is sovereign, and open this space for listening, creative margins and marginalities. With time, uh, my method of research took the uh, shape of a double movement. A first movement out of co-creating through a mutual contamination based on mixed in practice. And then a second movement in of returning to the focus of my relation flutist body flutist. It's a movement, I call it, of remembering. So these several movements of the multi-projects project uh, right now, they overlap, but it's possible to distinguish them by the form they are presented. So what I presented to you, the, the particular case this morning, what I call the first movement, is, uh, has the form of soprolus, that tr could be translated by blowing light, that is a co-creation with Jorge Alcaide, his teacher here is Jorge Sem, he's a musician, multi-instrumentalist, actor and poet. And it's a performan performance in transformation created uh, and we are performing since 2016 at Culture Template, which is an underground cistern. It's so a place, but also a cultural institution. Um, and the second movement of my method is what I performed for you. Um, it has this form of this solo piece essay, which is called Land Without Firefly, which I sought, thought to narrate and condense the experience of Sobrenus co-creation in this portable solitary form that I can bring with me outside the, the water system. So it's the return to this relation of the flute, body flute is carrying this living presence of the other. And this other is Jorge, is culture template, is the soprolus, the performance, everything that got contaminated by these two years of co-creation. So one important thing that I would like to mention is, is like on my methods that it's not beforehand that this theme, sound, light, darkness, was chosen as a priori concept of investigation. It emerged from the time spent in the cold, humid darkness of the sister, its underground being. So it's not a site-specific performance in the usual sense, on the contrary, we became specific to the place. And I'm talking about time, I'm talking about years, actually. So the place called for moths, for fireflies, for ghosts. In the abandon of sister, I also learned about angels, when light accepts the format of a chant. So though these nocturne seeds were already inside in my practice, Soprolus, the co-creation, opened the space to darkness and contaminated other following creations. And one of the main questions was always about how to sensitize our bodies to the obscure. And I had like, just real shortly briefly read three of my hypotheses. Because to obfuscate, it's not too light. Because breath, it's also too light. Because sound is light, pregnant of obscure. And just to shortly finish with the specific piece, essay I wrote, so I asked myself how to translate the practice experience inside the cistern to its outside, in text and in music. In music. I invoked fireflies. What does light have to say about the flute? How a light moves from the inside of the body. So I experiment to darken the spotlight of this image flutist sovereign in me. I transformed the modalities from which I was used to address my body to my body instrument. And I experimented the relation flutist body flutes through the relation light shadow as a creation matter. So in Soprolus and in Land Without Firefly, I experiment to not oppose light to darkness. The relation light dark transform in sound, in movement as an answer to an obfuscation that neither lights nor darken. What is the nature of this obfuscation? I don't know, so restless I create. I investigate the relation light-darkness from my musician listening. I say everything from the point of listening of the larva I am, 
I want to weave my cocoon of shadow. I want to give to a sparkle the shape of a chant. And I shelter here just to see the core why all this uh, in darkening. I will finish with a quotation by George D.D. Huberman and in his investigation on the apocalyptic vision inside Western contemporary critical thinking, that we need images to organize pessimism. We need images to pr protest against the kingdom of glory and its beams of harsh light. And I will just read a quote of him from his survival of the fireflies. One thing is to designate the totalitarian machine. Another thing is to give it so rapidly a definitive victory with no sharing. It is to see just the dark night or the obfuscating light of the projectors. It is to act as defeat. It is to be convinced that the machine plays its role with no remains or resistance. It is seen to see just an everything, nothing. It is, therefore, not to see the space, whether interstitial, intermittent, nomad, situated in the improbable of the opening of the possibility of the sparkles. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Robert and the Arena for these wonderful presentations. We'll take um, like a 10 minute break to just go out, use the bathroom, get some coffee, whatever you like, and then come back and we'll have a conversation between these four and also on the um, as well. So thank you and see you in a little bit.